Good morning and welcome to St. George's Church. I'm Gisela, one of the wardens here. Just a few to highlight the announcements in your bulletins. Mario Kart Night is hosted for 11 and 17 year olds. That's on April 19th. Uh, sign up is, I believe, out in the front or just call the office and let us know. Um, also, Young Adults, this one's not in the bulletin, but Young Adults is gonna be on April the 8th. Just uh, touch base with Hannah or Anya. Also, rubbish sale, that's coming up. There's a sign up um, out in the hall as well for anybody that's interested in helping or donating. We wish to acknowledge that we meet on the land that at the time of contact was held by the Adirondarin as an area of trade and ceremony by the two rivers. At various times, the land was occupied by both Haudenosaunee from the south and Anishabi from the north. In more recent times, the Huron Treaty gives rights to the Mississauga of the Credit First Nations. May we who dwell on or visit this land also be good stewards and honor those who come before us. Happy Easter, everyone. Welcome here to St. George's. I would invite the grown-ups to be seated and the young people to join with me up front. Good morning, good morning. How are you? Good, Ada? Yeah? All right. Hi, Nora. Hi, James. Oh, look at all this. Hello, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Well, today is Easter Sunday, and we have lots of things around us here to remind us that it is Easter, different things that help us re 
remember and think about new life and new birth and the resurrection of Jesus. Like for example, one of the symbols we have of Easter are all of these incredible flowers that are around here. And flowers remind us about new life because sometimes we don't get flowers in the winter time because they're buried under the snow. But when spring comes, we suddenly have this explosion of color as we have all of these flowers with us. And light too, yes. And often during the season of Lent, we don't have flowers in our church, but as soon as it's Easter morning, we have all of these incredible flowers around us. Another symbol for Easter are bunny rabbits and bunny rabbits oh like that one just like that one that you have there and this one that you have there what's that cameron he oh marcus was born in the year of the rabbit oh that's awesome well bunnies are a symbol of new birth because bunnies have lots of babies and yes uh and and then <laughs> They could have 10 at once? Really? I didn't know. That's a lot of babies, isn't it? 10 or, or two. But I think they have lots of babies, right? Can you imagine having 16, Cameron? To 16,000? Oh. The bellies would be very big to have that many babies. Yeah. That's. No, probably not all at once, but. Right. And then another symbol that we have for Easter are eggs. Now, I think I remember hearing that you were talking about eggs with Miss Hannah a while ago, right? Yeah. Yeah, because eggs, what comes out of an egg? A chocolate, yes, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> what? A chicken, a chicken or a little chick, right? A little chick can come out of an egg. Uh, well, yes, yeah, sometimes it's yolks, the ones that we get from the store. Yeah, you can crack it? Yes. But uh, chickens come out of eggs, right? And so the egg represents resurrection or new life. Because if you look at the, what eggs look like here, I'm going to just slide away a little bit, where you had all of your wonderful stuffies and friends that were inside this tomb that you put in there on Good Friday. Sometimes an egg, once the chicken comes out, there's a shell that's left over like. This is a Ukrainian Easter egg and it came from my family a very long time ago and inside it is hollow right yeah yeah and your tomb right now is hollow because all of your stuffies that were in there are now on the outside and you see that beautiful window up there yeah that window is about Jesus tomb being empty when they found it when the the women who came to the tomb found that his tomb was empty. And so we use eggs to help us remember that Jesus rose from the dead, that the tomb is empty. Yes, Cameron, yes. And that we have new life. So I have a bunch of eggs for all of you here. Yeah, they are, and these ones have, what's that? They, they're not Kinder Surprise. These ones have Smarties in them. <laughs> so let's let's yes yes uh that i'm going to uh yvonne i'm going to give these to miss yvonne and she'll take them back to miss hannah and she will help you get uh an easter egg out of here okay yeah yeah so but let's pray let's pray first thank you god for all of these symbols of new life and new birth and resurrection. Thank you that Jesus, that we celebrate his resurrection today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's give these to Miss Yvonne and she'll take them and you can all get an egg there. Okay, so just head back with Miss Hannah. Thanks very much, everyone. I had uh, a few brief announcements to make uh, as we begin our service. The first is that 
we will have the Eucharist or communion at two stations today. The first is at our high altar and the second is at our side altar over here. Uh, for those who would like to receive at the high altar, I would invite you to use these steps over here to enter the chancel, and after you receive the Eucharist, to use the steps on this side to come back into the nave. Okay? The other announcement that I wanted to make is that in addition to a young adult program, we also have Life in the Eucharist for children who are roughly around the ages of four to about ten. And if you have anyone who would like to go through Life in the Eucharist, where we talk about what the symbols of the Eucharist mean for us and how we understand communion together, then just let the office know or me know, and then we'll arrange those classes. They are April 13th and April 20th in the morning. And the last is that we have confirmation classes that are ongoing now for our teenagers. For anyone who would like to participate in confirmation classes, you can just let me or the office know again. And the final announcement that I had, we just received word early this morning that a longtime member, Hazel Smith, passed away last night. Hazel was a dearly beloved member here. She was a warden here at the church and a longtime director of our altar guild. Uh, and so we will begin the process of making arrangements for Hazel's funeral service, in which case, as soon as we have those arrangements in place, everyone will know. And, and in some ways, it's sort of fitting that Hazel passed away uh, last night. Uh, and today, this morning, we can celebrate new birth. We can celebrate resurrection uh, as we hold dear Hazel in our hearts, as well as her brother Sandy and their entire family. So at this point, I would invite you to stand with me as you're able. Our liturgy continues inside your bulletins. My sisters and brothers, alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. May his grace and peace be with you. Together, let us pray. God of life and power, through the mighty resurrection of your Son, you have overcome the old order of sin and death and have made all things new in him. May we, being dead to sin and alive to you in Jesus Christ, reign with him in glory 
who with you and the Holy Spirit is alive, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the proclamation of the word. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Good morning. The psalm this morning is 118. Jeff is going to play through the melody of the psalm and then I'll uh, sing it once and then you can all join in at the response. the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim. His mercy endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. There is a sound of exultation and victory in the tents of the righteous. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has punished me sorely, but he did not hand me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them. I will offer thanks to the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the gate of the Lord. He who is righteous may enter. I will give thanks to you 
before you answered me and have become my salvation. The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. On this day the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, 
Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of Christ. of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. When my brother and I were young little boys growing up in the town of Paris, our favorite place to play more than any other place in town was at the Anglican Cemetery. Didn't matter to us that the cemetery was Anglican. That, as it turns out, just happens to be a nice little coincidence. But what we really liked about it was that it was way up on a hill out at the edge of town, wedged between a forest and a gravel pit, surrounded by a wall of mature trees and vines. And for little boys, as you can imagine, there was no better place to play hide and seek than amongst those old weather-worn tombstones. No better place to build forts than amongst those mature vines. And no better place to pretend that we were knights searching for Excalibur or the Holy Grail. Now, we never intended any disrespect. It was just a really cool place to play. Away from the judgmental eyes of grown-ups. And I suppose that we had not yet learned the hard rules about life and death. Because as we get older, we start to look at cemeteries in a different way. They cease to become playgrounds and places of laughter and start to become prisons and places of weeping. Places where those whom we hold dear, where those whom we love, get placed in a vault and locked away under the ground. Places where we come to mourn our dead. In fact, I remember the exact moment when my view of cemetery started to change. I remember so vividly a time when I was nine years old and me, my dad, and my grandma Kisjak went to visit my grandfather's grave. And there at the graveside, my grandmother started calling out to grandpa again and again and again as she was sobbing and sobbing. And my dad was standing beside her, being strong, holding her and supporting her. And then there was me, looking at the blades of grass under my feet and getting very uncomfortable because I didn't feel sad about my grandpa. I I just thought he was someplace else. But from that moment on, cemeteries became a place of sadness and solemnity for me. As a priest, the hardest thing I ever do is funerals. I mean, I'd rather deal with four bridezillas than do one funeral. (laughs) And over these last 20 years, I have buried high school friends, family members, colleagues, mentors, as well as so many parishioners that I have come to deeply love and admire. And now whenever I walk through a cemetery, the gravestones are no longer anonymous because now so many of those gravestones bear the names of those whom I've served, whom I have loved and laughed with, 
and whose hands I held while they died. And so I find walking through a cemetery requires a certain discipline, a a certain mindset to hold back the wave of sadness and tears that would otherwise overwhelm me. Which is how our gospel opens this morning. It opens in a cemetery. And we're made aware four times in five verses that Mary Magdalene is weeping. But we can understand that, right? I mean, after having lived through the horror of that Friday, seeing her friend and rabbi tortured and crucified, and then in the early morning darkness on the way to his tomb, she's dealt another blow when she discovers that the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty, the body's gone. There was nothing that she could do. And that was more than she could bear. She felt helpless and hopeless standing there outside that tomb, unable to move as the tears just poured down her face. Why are you weeping, the angel asked. Well, why not, right? Why not? Her hopes and dreams for a different world, a better world, had collapsed on the cross, shattered by three nails and a crown of thorns. The powers of darkness had won out in the end or so she thought, until she heard the voice of Jesus calling her by name. And wiping the tears from her eyes, she she turns away from the tomb, and that's when she recognizes Jesus. And with that comes this realization that in raising Jesus from the dead, God not only has broken the power of sin and death that held us captive to the grave, but even more importantly, God was beginning to put this world back together again. This world that God loves, this world that God has not given up on. And he was beginning with the resurrection of Jesus and with a tomb that is empty. Which means that as Christians, we no longer fear death in the same way. Right? It's like the story of the father with his seven-year-old daughter who they were riding in a car. It was a hot summer day and one of those great big yellow bees flew into the car and the little seven-year-old daughter was very much afraid of bees and so was the father. And she said, let's get that bee out of here. But they couldn't, right? Because the bee, they couldn't get it out of the car. The bee kept flying up to the front window and then to the back window and it's buzzing over their heads. And the little girl was starting to get hysterical and the father was shouting at her not to be afraid, like that's supposed to help. (laughs) And about that time, that great big yellow bee landed right on the father's neck and it stung the father. And now the little girl became absolutely petrified and hysterical and began to cry and cry. And the father tried to calm her down and finally said to her, you don't need to be afraid anymore. Honey, you don't need to be afraid. The bee has lost its sting. The stinger is right here on my neck. The bee has lost its sting. In his letter to the Corinthians, the apostle Paul writes, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? So for us, there's no need to be afraid of what happens to us when we die. God raised Jesus from the dead, took away the sting of death, and set us free. Set us free to live abundant lives right now. Lives free from all the fears and worries and guilt and shame that we so willingly burden ourselves with. Burdens that we don't need to carry any longer. And you see, this is the discipline, this is the mindset that I mentioned earlier that allows us to hold back that wave of sadness and that wave of tears. Because when we talk about resurrection, we're talking about something that trends simply a discussion about life after death. See, the good news of Easter is not that Jesus has only been raised from the dead and is alive, but that the power of the resurrection can transform our lives as well. That new life. New life is possible right here and right now. You don't have to wait until you're in the grave to experience resurrection. And you know, we can see evidence of this death and resurrection process all around us. God has woven it into our daily lives and has built it into the very fabric of creation. Like when you walk outside today, you'll see new life springing forth from the earth. As well, the cells in our bodies are dying at a rate of millions every second, only to be replaced at a rate of millions every second. Or think about your skin, okay? Your skin is constantly flaking off and turning into dust. And in those same moments in which our skin is dying, our body is continually replacing the skin cells with new ones. I mean, you get an entirely new set of skin every 30 days or so. And by the way, this dead skin that we shed, 
makes up 90% of household dust, so feel free to vacuum more. <laughs> or think about forest fires. Their destructive power is crucial for renewal. Fires release valuable nutrients to the soil that were stored in the debris on the ground. They open up the forest canopy to allow sunlight and to clear out dead wood, which stimulates new growth. And they allow some tree species like lodgepole and jack pine to reproduce, opening their cones and freeing their seeds. And so all around us, we can see that death is the engine of resurrection. And the things that we have become attached to, whether it's a relationship, a job, a skill set, an identity, all these things that we have become attached to will eventually die and find their way into a tomb. But the good news of resurrection is that whatever it is that you have lost, the tomb will one day become a womb and give birth to something new in your life, something unexpected. Because some things have to die so that other things can be born. Which, when you think about it, is something that gives us hope. And if you're a Toronto Maple Leafs fan, frankly, that's all you got. <laughs> because the Leafs have been in the tomb for over 55 years. I mean, the Israelites didn't even have to wander in the desert that long. <laughs> but imagine that day, that glorious day, when hell freezes over, and the Maple Leafs are Stanley Cup champions. On that day, on that day, the downtrodden will be able to hold their head high, wearing their blue and white, and there will be new life. Now, if we want to live, and, and, and I mean truly live, okay, we need to engage death in all of its forms. And I think one of the most subtle yet pervasive forms of death in our culture is boredom. For some of us, we're so bored and numb and in such a low-grade state of despair that we're actually like the walking dead. Our success has actually served to distract us from just how deeply unsatisfied we are with our lives. And if we aren't careful, our success and security and abundance can lead to a certain sort of boredom, a numbing predictability, and a paralyzing indifference that comes from being way too comfortable. See, it's hard for us to get really excited about our lives, right? Many of us, as Thoreau says, lead lives of quiet desperation and go to our graves with our songs still inside of us. I think we ache to be truly alive. We ache to experience this resurrected life, a life full of love and meaning and purpose because we were made to give our lives to something bigger than ourselves, something beautiful, something that helps to make this world a better place, but it seems like we've forgotten how. Yet for these first Christians, when they received this gospel, they understood, they understood that Jesus' resurrection announced that the old patterns of life and death are over and that a new creation has begun in this world to renew this world, to redeem this world, to reconcile this world, to bring heaven and earth together in this world. And we have all been invited to take part in carrying this new creation forward. So what would that look like, right? Well, well for these first Christians, when they came together, they made sure that everybody in their midst had enough to eat they made sure that everybody was able to pay their bills. They made sure that there was always enough to go around because the resurrection for them was not just some abstract spiritual concept. It was a concrete social and economic reality. God raised Jesus from the dead to show the world that Jesus is Lord and Savior and that it's through his power, his example, his spirit that this world can and will be renewed. Now, there's a contemporary Irish theologian that I particularly enjoy reading. His name is Peter Rollins. And after a lecture, a student came up to Peter and, and said, you know, Pete, all this theology you talk about, do you deny the resurrection? And, Pe and Peter says, okay, it's time to fess up. Yes, I deny the resurrection. Of course I do. Everyone who knows me knows I deny the resurrection. 
I deny the resurrection every time I do not serve my neighbor. I deny the resurrection every time I walk away from people who are poor. I deny the resurrection every time I participate in an unjust system. And I affirm the resurrection every now and again when I stand up for those who are on their knees. I affirm the resurrection when I cry out for those people who've had their tongues torn out and when I weep for those people who have no more tears to shed. That's what we're trying to do. We stand up for resurrection. And so here at St. George's, we believe with great passion that the resurrection was not just a historical event. The resurrection is a way of living in relationship with God and with each other to bring heaven and earth together here in this world. The resurrection is a way of living free from guilt and shame, free from that voice in your head that tells you that you're not good enough, that you haven't done enough, or that you're not moral enough. And finally, the resurrection is a way of living free from the fear of death because you don't, like you know in the core of your being that nothing can ever, ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You don't have to wait until you're in the grave to be fully alive and to sing your song. Now, a few years ago now, one Sunday afternoon, my mom and dad and I, as well as my daughters, Allie and Marin, We went back up to that same Anglican cemetery at the edge of town. Mom and dad were were looking at where they had just purchased their plot and were showing me. And our voices were hushed and our words were chosen carefully and I tried not to cry. Meanwhile, my girls were tearing across the cemetery playing hide and seek amongst all those tombstones, laughing and then arguing over some imagined rule violation and then laughing again. And I remembered, at that point, I remembered what it was like when I was their age to live as if death did not exist. And right at that moment, standing there over that plot of ground, I was so tempted to run and play with them. I think next time I will. So on this Easter Sunday, may you find yourself standing in the doorway of a tomb and may the thought occur to you, there's no one in there. And may it compel you to live such a passionate, generous, hopeful, loving kind of way that the people around you will see you and say, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And so are you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
invite you to stand with me as you're able. My sisters and brothers, let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Standing, kneeling, or sitting, let us offer prayers to our gracious God. The response to Lord in your mercy is, hear our prayer. Let us pray. On this day when we celebrate Jesus rising in glory, we pray for the church throughout the world and for all the ministries that build up the body of Christ. In our Anglican cycle of prayer, we lift up the church in Jerusalem. Within the Anglican Church of Canada, we pray for Linda, our primate, Chris, the National Indigenous Archbishop, and Anne, our Archbishop. In our Diocese of Niagara, we pray for Susan and Colin, our bishops, and the people of St. Paul's, Caledonia. And here at St. George's, we give thanks for the lives of those in whose memory the flowers are given this Easter. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for this nation and for all nations, remembering especially those who are victims of political and social injustice. We pray for our MP, Lloyd Longfield, our MPP, Mike Schreiner, our mayor, Cam Guthrie, and all our elected city councillors, that they will govern with courage and equity. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all in need, especially remembering those who live alone and those who live lonely in the midst of family, that you will bring them your peace and comfort during this time. Lord, in your mercy. We remember with mercy those who sleep without shelter, cold and vulnerable, lacking enough food. We remember those who are overworked and those who have no work. Stir up in us the capacity to see ourselves in their struggles and to act so that others may have abundant life. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for this city of Guelph, for our neighbors and friends, and for those with whom we study and work. Guide and strengthen all people in our common life to know the gifts of your grace and love. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all those on our hearts and in our minds, either silently or aloud. We especially remember Ian, Mary, Heather, Madison, David, Mary and Terry, Wendy, Mike and family, Judy, Alina and family, Ryan and family, Rachel, Beverly, Elsie, Rosh and family, Barkey, Paul and Sarah, Margie, Faith, Ralph and Barbara, and Michael. Lord, in your mercy, We give thanks for all of our loved ones who have gone before us, especially lifting up Hazel, asking that our gratitude for their witness be apparent in all that we do. Lord, in your mercy, may all that we ask 
and all that you see is needed in our world be given to your people through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites us to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all of your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I would invite you to stand uh, with me as you're able. My sisters and brothers, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you to share that peace as is your custom. And together we say the prayer over the gifts. 
God, our strength and salvation, receive all we offer you this day, and grant that we who have confessed your name and received new life and baptism may live in the joy of the resurrection through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. We give you thanks and praise for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death. And by his rising to life again, he has won for us eternal life. Therefore, joining our voices with the whole company of heaven, we sing our joyful hymn of praise to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, Lord our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation, in calling Israel to be your people. In your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of air into truth out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night when he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice that we made acceptable in him may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new and bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we have died with you on the cross. Now we are raised to new life. We were buried in your tomb. Now we share in your resurrection. Live in us that we might live in you. Within the Anglican Church of Canada, we have something that we refer to as an open table or open communion, where just as Jesus invited everyone to gather around the table with him, everyone here is invited to receive the Eucharist this morning. My sisters and brothers, these are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God.
I invite you to stand as you're able for the prayer after communion. Together we pray, God of life, bring us to the glory of the resurrection promised in this Easter sacrament. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and in his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you and those that you love and those that you should love now and forever. Amen.
Hallelujah, let us go in peace to love and serve the risen Christ. Thanks be to God, hallelujah.